William Gargan stars as Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Here a guy called the deep type. It might be more a matter of geography than mentality. How deep is his grave? The National Broadcasting Company presents William Gargan in another transcribed drama of mystery and adventure with America's number one detective, Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Harry Craig speaking. Work is where you find it. When the case of Harry Jarvis fell into my lap, I was 900 miles from home base. Motoring south along the Florida Highway. My destination, Miami. I wanted to see how horses were treating men at the big winter track. My usual annual stopover, about 100 miles this side of Miami, was a motel. The Happy Traveler Motel. Big neon sign said, a 16 cabin set up complete with hot showers and television, run by two partners, Mo Birch and Harry Jarvis. I knew the two of them way back. They'd run a custom haberdashery in New York once before going south to change their luck. Inside, I found Mo, but missed Harry. The last I seen Harry, he said goodbye. For keeps, Mo? Yeah. After you two being inseparable for 10 years, 12. A business partnership's like a marriage. Sooner or later, it gets tired. There's a divorce. Now, one way of looking at it. Who saw it first? You or Harry? Harry. You heard the words faithful unto death? Who hasn't? That's me. I'm a sentimental slob, Craig. Uh, to change the subject, how's business? You saw my vacancy signs driving in? Yeah. Then tell yourself the answer. Business is lousy. I thought the happy traveler motel was a going concern. It was until Harry demanded his half interest in cash. Oh, the books couldn't liquidate Harry's claim and still balance, huh? Harry put $30,000 in his pocket. There wasn't even enough left to pay the towel and linen service. So where do you go from here? I don't know. You loved Harry. We knew ups and downs. Times were tough. We shared a crust of bread. Times were good. We bought each other diamond stiff pins. Then what's really got you worried about Harry? Last spring, Harry married a cabaret girl, a Kiki Adams. A singer in a roadhouse. I didn't know that. A homely shrimp like Harry. Forty-four years old, not a hair on his bald head. Taking a young cabaret chicken for a wife. Forty-four is the dangerous age for men, they say. A crack opens in your head. Yeah, and other things, Craig. The people Harry began to go around with. A bop musician, a hornblower with a crazy name, Bigelow Bernie. And uh, the gangster in the silk suit. Gangster in the silk suit? Tony Saxon. They ran him out of New York. They ran him out of Miami. They ran Tony Saxon out of uh, San Francisco, Seattle, Nevada, and Dubuque. Yeah. It could only be my imagination, something out of my nervousness for Harry, but the last days before we dissolved partnership, to me, Harry had a frightened look, like, like he was... Scared for his life? Yeah. And another strange thing... Yeah. He took his money and went. He had a bus ticket for Key West, he said. The bus at 6 o'clock that night. But I asked the driver the next day, Krogan, the driver. He stops over here to grab a bite and wash up. How did Harry look to him on the bus, I asked. But no, Harry. Krogan said Harry never got on that bus. You find it mysterious? What I find more mysterious is that Harry's wife, Kiki Adams, is still right here in town. In the same furnished apartment they rented last spring. Maybe Harry ditched her. Crazy the way he was over her? Impossible. Also, thinking from the angle of the wife, the cash opportunity she grabbed when she married the poor fish, Harry. Harry's 30000 in cash. Exactly. I ask you, would Kiki let a gold mine slip away on a bus? Craig, I need some help. Well, I figured only to stay overnight. Stick around, Craig. Find Harry for me. All right, I'll stay a few days. Try to find out what did happen to him. What cabin have I got? Cabin four the best. You get washed up, Craig. So then I'll broil you a steak. Free. On the house. Two and a half pounds of porterhouse steak later, with my stomach a foot in front of me, I went calling on Kiki Adams. 212 Elm Street. 
I had directions, Army, written out by Mo Birch. Drive east across the railroad tracks, then north one quarter of a mile past the county jail. One quarter of a mile past the county jail, I stopped. 212 Elm Street was a two-story frame building sandwiched between an abandoned schoolhouse and a plumbing supply wholesaler. A big front door with Isinglass slits on it and a brass knocker. I banged the knocker a little while, and then I tried the doorknob. I made less progress there. The doorknob came off in my hand. <laughs> a situation like that can become embarrassing. This one did. All right, drop it, Sam. It? The doorknob, Sam. I saw you cop it. You misjudge me, friend. I'm on the steps there beating my feet. I got a cold eye on you, Sam. You're low down jelly belly to the grass. Jelly belly? Hey, what kind of jive? Bigelow Bernie, Sam. And don't scratch your violin at me. Bigelow Bernie? I've heard about you. You're the bop musician. Hey, man, who's been scatting scandal about Bigelow Bernie? Never mind who's been scatting. Look, I'm a detective. Barry Craig. I'm here to visit a lady, Mrs. Harry Jarvis. Kiki, huh? My eye's getting colder, Sam. Where can I find Kiki Adams, Mrs. Harry Jarvis? At the downbeat. The downbeat? That the club she works in? That is. Thanks. You go back to beating your feet. And while you're mooning over Blue Mama Kiki, keep one fact in mind, huh? Shoot me, Sam. Kiki is supposed to be another man's wife. Put that in your horn and blow it, music man. <laughs> I caught up with Kiki a half hour before her cabaret act commenced. She was in her dressing room, doing back Say, hey, you're wasting calisthenics, lady. Strengthening your back muscles won't do a thing for your voice. Uh, I'm off the singing bit, lover. Oh? Yeah. Too many canaries around. Every kid out of high school. Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, I get trampled in the mob. So I worked out a specialty number. Acrobatics, obviously. Well, more than that. I do a back bend while tooting on the sax. See it? Vividly. While in the back bend, there's a glass of bubbling champagne on the floor. You get off the sax and drink the champagne. Without spilling a drop. Will the act get me to Miami? Unquestionably. <sighs> Who'd you say you were, lover? Barry Craig. Sagittarius? Sagittarius? Your astrology sign. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, Taurus the bull, I think. Taurus? Hmm. Will I do? Yeah. You can be favorable for me. Okay, lover, it's a date. After my 12 o'clock turn, whistle me over. A low, sweet whistle, lover. Now scram, huh, so I can practice? I got to drive Kiki home after her 12 midnight turn was extended to, uh, upstairs. Make yourself comfortable. To do that, I'd have to take off my shoes. Be my guest. Well, how you like my home, sweet home? Charming. Lila, the crummy dump. It could use a coat of paint. It could use a match. I know the answer. What? Move. Eh, tell that to my husband. I will. Where is he? Harry's away on a trip. Oh. Lover, I want to set you straight. On? How you got here. Well, you invited me. To pass the time socially. I'm a night owl, not a butterfly. Have I made a pass, doll? No, not yet. So why the sermon? <laughs> I got a canned speech I use on guys I pick up with. All right, finish it. I don't like talking to myself when I get home after the show. I tried being an introvert once. I don't like it. You're up here only for conversation, lover. In the canned speech. <laughs> All right, if I made a speech now? <laughs> speak. Exactly where is Harry Jarvis? Uh, why should you care? I'm worried about him. Worry? You know my husband? I do. Know him and like him. Well, this is news. You never asked me why I popped into your life. No, I assumed you were just another John looking to get acquainted. I looked you up on Harry's account. To put it simply, I'm a detective. A detective? With Harry on your mind? Yes. Why? What's with Harry? He isn't around. Well, I told you he's away on a trip. You failed to say where. Where? Well, I don't know. Well, you're his wife. Well, sure, but he didn't say where he was off to. I didn't even see him when he left. I was at the club. There was a note waiting for me when I got home that night. Well, what did the note say? Say? Call away for a few days, something like that. Well, when was this? A week. 
No, eight days ago. Where's the note? I got rid of her. What reason will I have to save her? Well, in these eight days, has Harry contacted you? No. And you didn't find that strange? I guess I did a little, but... But? Uh, this may shock you. I'm shockproof. It was a relief with Harry away, so I didn't worry too much about his silence. You see, Harry's in his middle age. But you uh, married him. Yeah, I did. Why? Why? <laughs> Search me, I ask myself. I'm going to ask you a big question now. Get on record with an honest answer and you'll thank yourself sometime. Well, what's the big question? Did you know Harry had liquidated his half interest in the Happy Traveler Motel? That on or about eight days ago, Harry had $30,000 in cash on him? Why, well, he was selling out in the motel. I know he'd already done it without the cash. Something um, happened to Harry? Until I know better, I'm proceeding on that premise, Mrs. Jarvis. <laughs> I left Kiki to waste her fragrance on the four walls of the flat. Downstairs, I ran into a familiar figure. Back sitting on the next door schoolhouse steps, busy, quote, beating his time. The bop musician, Bigelow Bernie. You're real low down, jelly belly to the grass, Sam. <laughs> I don't rate the cold eye, Bernie. I, I did nothing but converse with Kiki upstairs. It's still you and her husband in the field. I mean, if Passionflower upstairs still has a husband. Uh, what's your thought about that, Bernie? Harry will be home. Then, uh, why do you sit outside here beating your time and mooning over Kiki? Another man's wife, and no chance for yourself, you can see. I got an answer for you, Sam. I'm dying to hear it. You see up there where I'm pointing? That flat under Kiki's? Yes. Yeah. I live there, Sam. I'm beating my time down here because I live up there. Bernie. Yes, Sam. What if it turns out Harry Jarvis is never coming home to Kiki? He left her? Could be, no. Oh, never. Okay, so Kiki's one dish a man doesn't walk out on. But suppose Harry doesn't ever come home for a wholly different reason. Man, only one reason would keep Harry from coming home. Okay, anticipate me. Go ahead. He'd have to be dead, Sam. Real gone. Sam, is that what you mean by Harry not coming home? That's exactly what I mean. That Harry's dead? Dead. With you out in front now in the grab for Blue Mama. You hitting around and maybe I killed Harry? I'm asking you, uh, would you kill Harry Jolly? No, and oh, man. Then finger somebody for me. Somebody who would kill Harry. Hey, you were supposing before, now you're not. I've given up supposing. Come, Bernie, help the law and you help yourself. Well, man, if Harry is dead, there's only one man I know who... Who is this man? The sport in a silk suit. Tony Saxon? The man, Tony Saxon. Why would Saxon want to kill Harry Jarvis? Money, Sam. Harry was into Tony Saxon for money. Gambling debts? Tony Saxon is a gambler. Where do I find Saxon in this town? Three acres. That's a fieldstone house on Chestnut and Raleigh. Man, Harry is dead, huh? That's my morbid surmise. Say, all right for me to go comfort the widow? I'd say it's more decent to wait until the corpse confirms that fact. You know, I'm glad I had this talk with you, Sam. No more feeling low down, jelly belly to the grass, huh? Oh, no, I'm high in the stars, Sam, on a happiness jag. You sure go for Kiki. Oh, she's under my skin, Sam, under my quivering skin. Blue Mama Bigelow Bernie's blowing a high note tonight. <laughs> Swinging in the trees, and went to look up Tony Saxon. A field stone house. The house was lit up like the people inside it were afraid of the dark. Every room inside, and floodlights outside on the big lawn. To get in, you had to pass through a fence, what looked like an electric fence, to keep prowlers and police at bay. I looked for a buzzer, but couldn't find one for the life of me. While wondering how to get in, somebody solved the riddle for me. <laughs> uh, how do you do from behind that closed my eyes? I came to with something rattling in my ears. The rattling of bone like teeth. 
When I got my eyes open enough, I saw what it was. Chips. Ivory gambling chips on a green dice table. I was stretched out on the dice table. He's up six and 32. You win, Morty. Pick up your money. A sport in a black silk suit. Tony Saxon. Uh, what's this six and 32, mister? The time it took you to come to. We made a bet on it here. Me and Morty and Fatso. A bet on how long I'd be out? I said ten minutes. Fatso there said eight. Morty's bet was six minutes. You were out six minutes and 32 seconds on my stopwatch. Morty's bet. Morty there owes me a cut for cooperating. Beat it, boys. But not too far. A beat it just far enough to be able to keep me covered, fellas. We don't shoot fish in barrels, Craig. Then give me a running start if you really want to be sportsmanlike. You got death on the brain, Craig. Craig. You keep calling me Craig. Your name. You know. Your wallet says so does your police license. Did you restore everything back to my pockets in good order? Everything except your gun. You get that on your way out. Irene in the main foyer. She has your hat and your gun. So tell me. Uh, one of the boys, Fatso, there saw you prowling outside. He figured you were a lonesome stick-up case in three acres. He tapped you. My head doesn't just feel tapped. What happened to all the lights? Lights? The place was all lit up six and thirty-two ago. We turned them off. What happened to all the players? You're pretty smart. Smart enough to know you had a few games going here. Fatso didn't figure me a stick-up. He figured me a cop spelling a raid. He tapped me out until you shooed your guests home. I won't admit it or deny it. What can I do for you? Hand over the corpse of Harry Jarvis. Harry Jarvis is dead. I'll make book. Dead but no corpse. Not yet. That's bad news if true. You lost a friend? A debtor. Harry owes me 20000 His paper. Maybe you owe his estate 10000 How's that? The last Harry was seen, he had $30,000 on him. Good night, Craig. Morty, show Craig out. Hold up here behind an electric fence. Uh, after being thrown out of as many states as I can name, uh, who do you pay protection to, Saxon? Grandma Jones. Grandma Jones? My landlady. I rent three acres from her. Good night, Craig. Find Harry, let me know. A client of mine dies, I like to wire flowers. Outside Saxon's fortress wall, I found fresh company. A chap parked in my car, sprawled on the rear seat. He looked dead until he spoke. Don't you be alarmed, friend. You better be alarmed. I'm pointing a gun at you. Well, put it away. My name's Frawley. Bill Frawley. I'm the law here in Northgate. That is all the law they got this side of the county seat. Why don't you put the gun away? When I see the badge. Hmm. Here it is. See, I was by a spruce across the street a while before. When that Saxton croupier came down on your head. You just watched the show? For now, I'm the law, but I'm peacefully inclined when it comes to Saxton's game. He's the kind of commissioner's problem, and I got my complaint about Saxon up with Commissioner Hawkins right now. Besides, I was standing under that spruce with other things claiming my thoughts. What other things? Harry Jarvis, is he dead? What's your answer to it? Dead. Same conclusion you came to, friend. How do you know? Well, see, I was talking to Bigelow Burnley after you had talked to him. Oh, I see. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I got something down at the jailhouse now that kind of proves Harry Jarvis is dead. You have to come see? I do. She started her. The Northgate jailhouse was a clapboard frame shack a March wind could blow off its foundation. It had an office and a cell that could accommodate two overnight guests. At the moment, the room was a single. One prisoner, fast asleep on a cot. He's what I brought you to see, Craig. The prisoner? Him. Looks like a hobo. Well, that's the trade he claims. Says his name's Dusty Ames. What does he do besides sleep? He loves to cuss you out. He had an ache now for three days. Turned down chicken yesterday and today. How come? Huh? Hunger strike. He wants his constitutional rights. Those being? Freedom. Freedom. Put him back on the road, he said. Three days, you said. Uh, what do you do here in Northgate? Throw away the keys? 
Well, I'm waiting for the wagon to come take him to the camp seat now. He'll get his hearing there. How does he connect with Harry Jarvis? I see the clothes on him. Yeah. The striped and blue suit. <laughs> Those yellow shoes. Well, who can miss them? I know the suit and yellow shoes like they're my own. Harry's clothes. This Dusty Ames was wearing Harry Jarvis's clothes when I picked him up over in Route 9. When Dusty Ames came awake, he began to howl. I want my rights. I'm a Federalist. President McKinley will hear about this. He does. You have a miracle on your hands. Look, Dusty, if you've got any wits, collect them. Wits? Why, sir, I was professor of cosmological dialectics in Katie Did College. But the road got into your blood, huh? The call of the wild Mackinac. So you turned in your cap and gown. I took to the open highway. And killed a man here in Northgate. That's a lie. You're in his clothes? I found those clothes, sir. We've been asking you where. I wouldn't tell the sheriff. Why should I tell you? Because when it comes down to it, I'm going to beat it out of you. Civilized man always reverts to the beast. Your predecessor in those clothes was a dear friend of mine, Dusty. A dear friend? A man's greatest possession in a cold, materialistic world. Sir, I have a poem right here in my pocket, after the fashion of Edgar Guest. Ah, I'll read it. No matter where the road may go, I'll always think of dear friend Joe. The bullfinch of the open road finally showed us where he'd found himself a new wardrobe. A tree hollow in the piney woods. The clothes were right in there, sir. Wrapped in tar paper, set to burn. See yeah. the cinders? Yeah, I see them. Hmm. I had a time brushing suit off the bundle. Clothes smelled of smoke when I put them on. Some clothes have been burned. I find bits of charred fabric. And these, Sheriff? My shirt buttons. Yeah, some clothes had burned and something stifled the fire. Wind, maybe. Or the fire simply choked. Too much stuff on it, smothering it. How did you come on it, Dusty? I had my repast to tend to. It caught me a stray chicken. Fat little thing, six pounds. Looked around for a tree hollow to cook my supper. When you changed into the new clothes, what did you do with your own rags? Hung them to a tree. What for? As a sign that Dusty Ames had come through. A sign that there were stray chickens in these parts. A sign for other hobos. Live and let live. Craig. Sure. Harry Jarvis is buried here in Piney Forest. Yeah, looks like. How big is Piney Forest? Bigger than Northgate Township. Close to 400 acres. Meaning we'd need a regiment to unearth the body here. It needs more manpower than Northgate's got. We could appeal to the state governor for National Guard. No. We may not need to. Not need to turn up the body, Harry Jarvis? The time and labor and agony. We might be able to avoid all that. How's that? See if we can get the murderer to find the body for us. Now, that'd be a trick. Trick is exactly what I have in mind. Yeah. We'll try to make a trick do for manpower, Sheriff. brief Sheriff Frawley on what I wanted him to do. I'm to let the word get out that we got ourselves now witness. That your hobo prisoner let on eat uh, seen the actual murder and burial in Piney Forest. Now, who do I let the word out to? The town elder and the town idiot. Just so the news percolates. Just so it reaches uh, Kiki Adams, Tony Saxon, and that bop musician. And big low Bernie. <laughs> I know what. What? I'll step into that downbeat club and have some beers. You know, ain't nothing like a bar room for loosening the man's tongue. Yeah, you do that. Now, when the word does percolate, uh, I still ain't exactly clear. Our phony eyewitness right off becomes a marked man. A killer, whoever he is, must pull a repeat performance. Kill Dusty Ames, I guess. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, the wool around your brain. Well, I still don't see. Dusty Ames is safe in the jailhouse. Safe? <laughs> A nine-year-old boy can get into your jailhouse, Sheriff. Just provide him with a dime can opener. Besides, you won't make it tough for the killer to get in. I won't? No. Front door unlatched. Just the cell door closed. With Dusty Ames, a sitting duck in a cage. 
Easiest target in the world, a dream pigeon. Now get on it, Sheriff. Sometimes it plays exactly according to script. Sometimes it doesn't. This time it did. I could hear the village chimes when the silhouette appeared at the jail window. Head and shoulders and face with no identity to it in the pitch dark. I was in the office under the desk. A neat hunk of gymnastics considering my size. It was more than two minutes before the killer dared to try the door. His feet were six inches from my nose when he stopped dead center in the office. I had to imagine the rest. My line of vision was too low now. I imagined him estimating the sleeping figure of Dusty Ames, estimating how to make his shots effective. I didn't wait for the murder of the hobo. I just took aim at a 45-degree angle from the floor and shot my pigeon in the leg. That's your killer. It's time for rejoicing. But I didn't feel that way this time. I only felt like getting drunk. It kept me like a fox playing games with a rabbit. How's your leg, Moe? On fire. Why didn't you aim higher? Moe, why did you ask me to find Harry? I asked you to find Harry to demonstrate to me how safe I was. I decided to make a test with you, a smart New York detective. If you couldn't catch me, nobody could. I could stop worrying. Well, you gave me a demonstration. You killed Harry for $30,000. You've got it stashed away. I killed Harry because I was too old to start over again. We made our life together, and Harry was condemning me to death. Bankruptcy isn't death, Mo. At my age, it is. And my condition, it positively is. Your condition? Heart, liver, kidneys. <laughs> Inside, I'm like a bombed out Berlin. It was no time for me to start all over being young and ambitious. Mo, my thought is you're a little off. No, my thing. Say I'm worn out in the world, that's all. Just say that at 53, I, Mo Birch, got so confused, I fired a gun at Harry Jarvis. I want to know where you buried him, Mo. Sure. You want to know, and I'll tell you. Right now, I'm... I think. Sometimes you take no pleasure in the catch. Sometimes all you want to do is get drunk. You have been listening to William Gargan in another exciting transcribed mystery drama from the adventures of Barry Craig, confidential investigator. Tonight's story, The Sneak Assassin, was written by John Robert. Next week, it's the strange story of Sweet Goddess of Murder, about which Barry Craig has this to say. In next week's story, Sweet Goddess of Murder, the fur flies thick and homicidally when a lovesick furrier designs a dream jacket for his ever-hating wife. A straight jacket, that would be. The National Broadcasting Company has just brought you an NBC Radio Network production with William Gargan, starring as Barry Craig, confidential investigator, directed by Arthur Jacobson. Also heard were Parley Bear, Herb Ellis, Betty Lou Gerson, Marvin Miller, and Joe Cranston. Eddie King speaking. Follow the Abbots in another exciting mystery tonight on most NBC radio stations.